Very warm welcome to you all as part of this Open Air Ireland Carbon Dioxide CDR Startup Interview Session. Just a bit of context on our session now today. So the IPC's report makes it very clear that even by completely cutting all of our emissions, we're still going to be on track to experience dangerous levels of global warming, throwing the entire planet, our way of life, and the balance between nature and humanity off track. The science is clear, we must not only mitigate emissions and reach net zero, but we're also going to have to go emissions negative, removing the historical and current emissions and restoring the climate and atmosphere to a state of balance. Removing emissions will be especially crucial for the hard to abate sectors such as aviation and agriculture. So we have a very really impressive panel with us here today, and this interview comes at an exciting time for CDR around the world, and particularly in Ireland. With the advancement of open air's policy proposal in Ireland, and in the context of Ireland's ambitious climate targets, uh, with achieving a climate neutral economy by 2050 known as the National Climate Objective, this is a great time to discuss the unique potential Ireland has as a CDR ecosystem. So today's discussion aims to explore the solutions on offer in Ireland, the potential of Ireland as a CDR ecosystem, and what is needed to turn this potential into a reality. So today's panel is made up of Javier Santillo, the co-founder and director of Blue Carbon Ireland, a company which provides innovative habitat restoration projects, ecosystem services, sustainable aquaculture, and carbon removal. And secondly, we have Morris Bryson, the co-founder of the company Silicate, a company that is harnessing the power of enhanced weathering to rapidly remove excess CO2 from the atmosphere. We have Dr. Graham Andrews, a professor of geology at West Virginia University, whose research has recently turned CO2 sequestration potential of basaltic minerals, and Sarah Barker, program director at Dogpatch Labs, which provides a platform for entrepreneurship and innovation with a mission to accelerate the development of Ireland's startup ecosystem. Guys, it's all great to have you here today. Um, and finally, myself, I am Cody Rossi, and I am a policy advocate with Open Air, and I've been involved in development and advocacy of CDR policy here in Ireland, uh, as well as creating content for CDR's and Open Air's YouTube channel. So I'd like to begin by asking you, Javier, would you mind telling us a bit about the story of Blue Carbon Ireland and its activities in the CDR space? Well, first of all, thank you. Um, I'm glad to be here. Um, yeah, so Blue Carbon Ireland, and we, we were funded only at the end of last year, and we it's, it's taking off only since March this year. So we're, we're just a few months old. So my, uh, my background, I have almost 20 years experience in corporate sustainability, and, but I've been working with large corporations in different areas on the environmental and, and the social side. And for the past 10 years, I've been focusing on climate for different reasons, I was in Ireland by the time the pandemic started, and I, I was working still for a global environmental consultancy called EcoAct in, a, in London, but uh, I, I ended up working in a, in a place called the Galway Innovation, Innovation District. So here, um, the magic happened because I, uh, we, I met two other co-founders. One of them is uh, an expert in the marine environment and is, he's a geologist as, uh, as well and also has um, a marine survey company called Geomara and another person working in regenerative agriculture, the, the third co-founder. To make a long story short, uh, Blue Carbon Ireland was created with the idea of imitating, enhancing and imitating natural processes that occur, that occur in, in, the, uh, in the marine environment and I scale them. I scale them for the creation of ecosystem services that are very valuable for us, including carbon removal. And broadly, there are two types of projects, ecosystem restoration projects that provide a number of ecosystem uh, services, including protection of existing carbon sinks or the creation of new carbon sinks, but with difficult to prove the, the permanence of those new carbon sinks. So the CDR angle of our company is based on scaling permaculture or, or sustainable aquaculture of uh, macroalgae or kelp to use it as feed stock for the creation of biomass for creating biochar, which has different uses. And also in, under certain conditions, you can also remove carbon. And so that, that's what we do. And is there anything in particular that attracted you to the West Coast of Ireland for for a blue carbon project. So well, that's family roots. Uh, so <laughs> I, um, it was just like, it, it, it was actually a coincidence or 
or, or many things they came together. So I have my family are from, uh, or my political family are from the, from the west of Ireland. I used to live here. Um, while working for EcoAct, I was involved in first project in issue blue carbon credits in the world, which is mangrove restoration in Myanmar. And also EcoAct, they, they developed other projects, other mangrove restoration projects, uh, seagrass uh, project in the, in the Western Mediterranean. So I came here without experience. And then here I found myself in a in a country or environment or ecosystem which or Ireland, Ireland is proved is proven is proved very successful in creating and attracting companies in life sciences and tech, you know, pharma, big tech, big pharma, particularly in particularly in Galway, Dublin, Limerick, Cork, in also tech or any, anything tech. For different reasons, has proven very successful uh, uh, attracting and enhancing a gradient ecosystem where startups can thrive and also large companies that can go come and set up here. And those those are the two areas that is exactly what we do. We are combining life sciences or environmental sciences with with technology. Uh, so that's why I found uh, it was no brainer for me. Great, thanks, Javier. And uh, Maurice, would you mind just telling me a little bit about um, the solution that Silicate brings to the table? We'd be happy to, and thanks for having us along. So we do enhanced weathering. So we speed up the weathering of certain minerals that capture carbon, and they lock it away uh, as bicarbonate for about 100,000 years. So in terms of the scale of permanence, we're kind of up there at the tippy top for how long we're removing carbon from the atmosphere for. And we use a certain mineral um, that comes from concrete. So we take waste concrete, and there's lots of it. So concrete, there's about 20 billion tonnes of the stuff produced around the world each year. And between two and five percent of that becomes waste. So it gets returned to where it was produced from the construction site back to where it was made and then goes to waste. So we take that and put it to work. And how we do that is by crushing it and spreading it on fields and agricultural land. And it's kind of counterintuitive, but actually, you know, you might think that concrete's man-made. It's not very good for the environment. It's actually the opposite. It's actually very clean. So there's lots of good things in it. It's really good for the soil. And it also happens to capture carbon. So that's kind of what we're up to. And um, yeah, very delighted to be here with you guys today. Of course. Um, and I suppose I'll open this up to the, the whole panel. But um, what would be some of the main benefits that you guys see about Ireland as somewhere to do business and in particular to do uh, innovative business such as CDR? I'll jump. I'll jump. Um, it's the supports. So, you know, so there's a lot of entrepreneurial supports when you're beginning a business here through Enterprise Ireland and other schemes to get an idea from an idea to potentially a, a kind of a business model or certainly a business plan. I think the supports are really strong in Ireland for that. And as you grow the business, there are more supports that come on stream for you as well. So for me, any kind of business, be, be it CDR or something else, I think Ireland kind of really um, punches above its weight in terms of business support. So that's kind of a key reason for us starting off here. Sarah, maybe you could speak a little bit to just your experience with Dogpatch and, and some of the supports that you know are available for, for entrepreneurs in Ireland wanting to start up. Yeah, yeah, sure. So it kind of goes to, to what Javier was saying about there's already this pre-existing sort of talent plus tech ecosystem that goes really well or is just well established within Ireland. And then um, Morris, how you we were saying about there's just sort of a disproportionate amount of supports for how small of a country it is. But the other thing that we try to think about at Dogpatch is how can you use Ireland's relatively small size as a country to sort of be an opportunity? Um, so what we try to do is use that um, as sort of a way to be better connected. Um, so what we're looking at right now is how can we better connect the climate tech ecosystem? Um, and what, what we're trying to sort of do is leverage all of our pre-existing connections with industry and government and policymakers and startups, obviously, but also the big guys, the FDIs, um, that kind of sort of paved the way for all of those supports to exist. Um, that's what we're really looking at as Ireland's sort of advantage for, for setting up here and having a strong ecosystem. And then even going back to, Cody, you were saying the work you do with helping other developing nations with climate tech, like Ireland as an island nation has the, the opportunity to sort of position itself as an exporter of new technologies, specifically around 
um, sea level rise and things like that. So, so that's how we see it at Dogpatch and what we're trying to sort of create with our new climate tech program. Because Ireland has been labeled at times as more of an importer of technologies. And I feel like, you know, especially with the exciting prospects that you could have with CDR, we could really shift from being an importer and a technology taker to someone who actually, you know, exports and creates a first-time experience and first-time knowledge of working with these new innovative technologies. Right. Yeah. That's kind of what we're hoping, especially with sort of the FDI <laughs> field kind of shifting um, is how do how do we sort of like take up that space with with more small scale, but innovative companies. And um, Graham, what what would be from a specifically geological natural potential? What why should a CDR company come to Ireland? other than the, the business supports and entrepreneurial? Um, I think there's a lot of good reasons. Building on what Sarah just said, Ireland's a small country, a small island. And I think that, I think that gives advantages in itself. When you look at most CCS and CDR programs that are being rolled out in North America, in the EU, they're focusing on industry. They're focusing on big CCS hubs for heavily industrialized economies. And there's not really looking at CDR and looking at maybe the, the more techie side of things. Like they're not, they're, they're not, this isn't focused around small scale startups. It's focused on big industry. But it, th- that, that way of looking at it doesn't serve economies like Ireland's that are dominated by agriculture, are not heavily industrialized, uh, have relatively small spread out urban areas. And we have, um, uh, so we, there's not a lot of opportunity for say, capture a point source for storage, but we have a lot of industries that need abated and relatively high transportation uh, costs and emissions as well. Another reason I think builds in, and it ties in with geology uh, in a sense, is Ireland's already a leader. It builds on your point about being a tech importer, but one re- one place where Ireland's already in a good position is in green energy. And as a, a tech leader and also a rollout leader for wind, uh, for wave, for biogas. So I think Ireland is a really good place to serve as sort of a counterpoint example to the big industrial CCS, CDR kind of moves in parts of Europe to maybe serve the other parts of Europe and parts of the world that don't have that. Ireland specifically then with its, its geology is, is helped by having very diverse geology. So it's a good place to test different options. So. Uh, whether that be starting in soils, we have all kinds of different soils and different agricultural practices and scenarios. And we have the multitude of rock types and uh, really cool to hear about Morris's use of and silicate's use of um, recycled concrete into that. So we've got a really good mix of things that ties in with that ecosystem. I'm specifically interested in basaltic rocks that are sort of, um, they, they, they work chemically in the same way that uh, the recycled concrete works, but the northeast of Ireland in County Antrim has um, one of the biggest concentrations of that, because volumes, accessible volumes of that type of rock in Western Europe. So there's, um, uh, and there's already increasing recognition of, of that. And there's opportunities offshore for storage that have been explored. So Ireland has lots of opportunities, but certainly on the geological side, it's somewhat um, uh, lagging behind on the aquaculture and uh, agriculture side. And in terms of, I suppose I'll put this to you all, um, what would be the main challenge that CDR should be trying to address in Ireland? Is it emissions from the agricultural sector as Graham was saying there, it isn't really as much of an industrialization um, problem in that we don't have a large CCS sector. So kind of what, why do we need CDR in Ireland? 
Well, if I if I go first on that, I think Ireland is a really good place to look at ways to abate from agriculture because there's things like um, methane production is much harder to abate. So that increases the impetus to try to abate CO2. And um, Ireland's already a leader in agriculture and especially in dairy production, which is unfortunately one of the, and beef production, which are amongst the biggest producers of CO2 and, and methane. Um, and we're already uh, ahead of uh, much of the world in the EU in terms of sort of organic farming or, or at least uh, more sustainable, lower impact farming practices that this ties in with. And I think with the, uh, we're blessed with so much wind power in particular and increasing offshore wind, hopefully just around the corner or over the horizon, a revolution in wave power, uh, beginnings of uh, rollouts of geothermal, especially in the north of Ireland coming in. I think many parts of Ireland have got real opportunities to support mechanical engineered direct air capture systems like we have seen attract a lot of investment and, and attention. Um, those, those systems need space. They need access to lots and lots of cheap renewable energy, which we have in abundance, especially at night when other uses are low. Uh, and the good thing is those mechanical DAC systems can operate pretty much anywhere in the world and they can operate any time of the day. So I think Ireland has lots of opportunities to have hubs, for example, for to aid in the development of those. I might even say, you know, you asked Cody, why do we need CDR in Ireland? I think we need CDR everywhere. Um, and I think Ireland is a good place to try it out um, for a number of reasons, which have been listed. But a few others, maybe, you know, there's so much sea coverage around here and the abundance of, of green energy, is, as Graham was talking about. If we can get that up to scale, it'll enable direct air capture to be potentially a great resource here in Ireland. And then for us, you know, for enhanced weathering, be it basalt, like Graham was talking about, or concrete or olivine, you need farmland. And, you know, Ireland's synonymous with farming. And we go, we go hand, hand in hand together. So that's really helped us, I think, you know, as we work with a lot of farmers and we're working in a country where farming is such a kind of a, such a, a real part of the economy here and, and society that um, as we try and grow our, our what we're doing, we're in a place where I guess the farming community wants to hear about it, I suppose. And it's a, it's a, the government is certainly very pro agriculture, of course. And so anything we can do to try and make agriculture more sustainable, which is definitely what we're trying to do, um, has received great support. So I think there's, there's a lot of opportunity there for different CDR processes and um, technologies to come to Ireland and, su and to succeed. Um, and we certainly felt that with the enhanced weathering front. So it's been great so far. Uh, uh, likewise, just to add to the, obviously, because Ireland's economy and culture, uh, the emissions associated to pasture-fed protein fat are really hard to abate. Um, the conversation about reducing the herd is a difficult one in Ireland. So CDR, I'm not proposing that we, we push the CDR agenda so we don't look at other ways to feed the world, but it's, it, 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 is, it is part of the mix, definitely, we need to. Um, and then I, I laugh to that uh, because Ireland has been very successful attracting the tech FDIs. So there is type of emissions that are currently dif difficult to abate as well in Ireland, which is the digital associated digital decarbonization we're still a long way away from that in ireland yeah the tech industry and uh and that, that is, is, is also a good thing like it's, it's an it's, it's a it's an incentive because we we have here large and they need a headquarters for the entire nasdaq and 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 with that you have also like the head of sustainability and so it's a conversation that they they want to have but yes like cdr can provide either at source or as a in a compensation model it can help to in the transition and beyond until all that uh, future source of green uh, uh, green energy um, is in place and and that's and the, the, and the third thing is actually that so we can what we can do through cdr is exploring ways of by design build all those massive uh, offshore wind farms already abating 
or looking at ways that we lower the embodied emissions of all those, each one of those windmills are going to be as high as the Eiffel Tower. And there is an, a complicated supply chain that's going to go with that and the servicing of it uh, through, through uh, daily servicing of those um, wind farms. We can provide ways that we can compensate for those emissions and also look at ways, I don't know, like carbon enriched cement, uh, for example, ways that we can uh, uh, by design make the footprint of those new sources of energy even close to net zero or even early net negative. It just seems like there's there's so much potential there. And like with renewable energy, you know, 20, 30 years ago, the, the price was insanely high. Um, so what I would love to know is like, how do we bring these technologies to a place where they can be usable at scale and a lot of these uh, great ideas can come to fruition? And, and specifically in Ireland, what kind of supports are, you know, can bring them to be where they need to be? As we've discussed, there's a lot of support for, and we receive a lot of support from, there is, there is, there is this ecosystem to uh, help, to nurture and help to grow uh, startups uh, in particular in this area. Well, I can talk about the could be in place because that's what we're trying to do. Yeah, I would love to hear about that. Yeah, so uh, currently at Dogpatch, we're working on to sort of a double-sided um, approach to this. So uh, we're working on an accelerator program and then also a hub. So the idea behind the hub is this need for more connection and collaboration between, um, as I mentioned before, private, like the private sector, industry, startups, um, all to come together in one place. As Javier mentioned, there's like a, a barriers in communication um, as with anything else, uh, there's a lot of labeling and sort of siloing within different, like, is this climate tech or is this circular economy and like all these kinds of things where like buckets of money tend to get sort of ring fenced into these things. Um, and then just through our work with with various different corporate program partners and and even with the government, we, we've just come to know that policy can often be a huge barrier for any startup. Um, and also the, the thing that's interesting, personally, I think with anything climate tech related, and that's the most general term I use to just lump everything in, is the sense of urgency around it isn't just about like getting the return for your shareholders and your investors being on your back to be first first mover and all this kind of stuff. It's, it's like the real existential urgency behind it as well. Um, so what, what we're hoping to do is try to get all of these players in one space, speaking the same language, working at the same pace. It, it, it's such a, a trope now within startups, but fail fast. But it's also if you fail fast, then you you get solutions faster as well. So that's what we're hoping to sort of build is, is be this platform for everyone in Ireland who is either looking to support climate tech or be employed in it or start a startup or if you're a researcher um, and you have all the tech, but none of the startup know-how, um, it's super clear where you can go. Um, also have a channel for climate tech and impact, in, impact investors to know exactly where to go when they come into Ireland. Um, just make it super straightforward um, and break down all those barriers that, that go along with just the way life works right now. Um, and then our accelerator program, we're really looking to sort of bring in, mirror it off of our NDRC program, which like our mantra kind of thing is founder first, entrepreneur led. Um, so really build up a network of successful climate tech entrepreneurs that can act as mentors to, to new startups coming um, up through the ranks in Ireland. Um, and then also, like I said, have that sort of entrepreneur-led uh, content. So it's all hyper-relevant. And um, the way that connects into the hub is that you would obviously have access to all the corporate partners and government uh, departments that we would have involved. So you you have direct route to them to get information and advice and proof of concepts and access to, to infrastructure and all that kind of stuff. So just really helping, um, trying to get everyone moving faster and speaking to each other and collaborating in the way that needs to happen for, for things to move forward as fast as they need to. So yeah, it sounds like the full package of everything that is needed for, <laughs> for someone to this, this start up because I feel like there's I, some, some might have ideas, but they might not have the, the exact know-how and you're putting them in, 
helping them find the people that they need to find. Right. And it's all easier said than done, right? It's kind of like, well, if it was that easy, then wouldn't it have been done before? Um, so it's definitely not not always smooth sailing. And, but it, it's kind of one of those things that like people or I say people, but just things get siloed because it's kind of easier that way, right? Like if you're only talking to your little circle, then everything's just a little bit smoother. But if you have to have those tough discussions or if you have to have those whiteboarding sessions um, that get a little bit <laughs> scribbly, then uh, it, it's a little bit tougher. But if you're sort of like forced to be to be confronted with with different perspectives and different things going on um, all in one space, then it it becomes a little bit easier by being a little bit harder. The other thing I think is interesting is if we had this sort of hub of activity with all the stakeholders in one place, how we could get just everyday people involved as well. Like right now, if you're, if you're someone who's skeptical about CDR, like where do you turn to probably like YouTube and you're going to hear what you want to hear. Um, we all know. <laughs> so if you, but if you had a place where like, as someone who lives in this country and cares about climate and wants to know more and you want an unbiased opinion or just like a good overview of what's being done, um, if you could walk into a place and get sort of the who's who of of what's going on, then I think that would do a lot more, not only for people getting more involved on a personal level, but also for for using their their dollars and their votes a little bit more wisely. Great. <laughs> and I suppose as we're coming close to the end of the session, um, I'll put this to you all. Uh, where do you see climate tech, CDR, Ireland's innovative future in 20 in 20 years, like, do you see us achieving our climate targets? Do you see these hubs sprouting into uh, wonderful industries, spreading Sierra technology across the world? Um, are you optimistic, pessimistic? Um, first of all, Sarah, sign us up, please. We'd love to join. This sounds great, this initiative. And that's kind of what we need. I think, you know, we're talking about kind of linking up of different resources and slowly I'm beginning to see that in Ireland and also in Europe you know kind of a collective thinking around how do we make how do we make carbon removal a real thing like an actual industry and then scale it to be huge you know how do we do that that's happening slowly now across Europe and in Ireland and one example I would give is that I, only a couple of weeks ago I was introduced via an old friend to a guy working at EIC Climate Kick and he told me that he's working with the Department of Agriculture to find really great kind of innovative solutions to lower emissions in agriculture, which are around, I think it's between 34 and 37% of Ireland's emissions come from agriculture, probably mostly from production of, of milk and, and, um, and meat. So it's really cool to, to learn about these kind of European centers like Climate Kick and then the Department of Ag linking up to try and find the actual solutions and then to grow those quickly. Um, to copy the trope you were saying, Sarah, but you know, fail fast. I think that's what they're trying to do is find the actual solutions and then get them to grow quickly. And um, hubs like what you're talking about, where you have all of the different stakeholders in, at, at, one, at one kind of place, it'll be easier to find the ones that are actually going to work. And I think if we can make that happen, then yeah, Ireland is in a very strong place to succeed on its climate goals um, over the next 20 years or so. But it's an uphill battle. You know, if we've got emissions from agriculture, which are really hard to get rid of, unless you, you know, lower the emissions from your, your animals in particular, I think it's a big challenge. But, you know, hearing about this kind of collective action together and really kind of not just siloed thinking, but really kind of broad scale thinking, this is really what makes me quite optimistic about where we're going um, on lowering emissions in Ireland. I think the way I would, I'd see things is, Ireland's got a, a direct competitor, a direct model that we can work in parallel with, and it's Iceland. Small, stuck out in the Atlantic, but friendly to investment, friendly for tech of all kinds, a, a well-engaged, educated, environmentally conscious population and governments that reflect that. And they're leaders in different aspects of CDR and and it, it's they're helped by their geology, but they don't have access to uh, a lot of the other things that Ireland has access to. The agriculture in, in Iceland is much more limited, for example. There's nothing that the, they can do in Iceland that we can't do in Ireland. And Ireland has another big advantage, maybe even slightly more than, than Iceland does. Ireland's the natural bridge between the EU, 
now the UK outside the EU and Canada and the United States. Like that can really be leveraged for whether it's venture capital money in Manhattan or it's tech startups in Silicon Valley. Ireland's the place to attract North American investment into the EU with a base in Ireland. And similarly, it's, it's that link. And anything that we learn, that learning by doing and failing fast, anything that we learn here in Ireland tech-wise or application-wise or funding and policy-wise is immediately applicable in the UK. It's immediately applicable through the rest of the EU, certainly the agricultural parts. So I think a couple of things need to happen sort of on the, um, um, on the Dublin front of talking to policymakers, whether elected or unelected. One is education about the difference between CDR and CCS. Trying to make the point that, that is well recognized, as, as Mara said, about the, uh, the problems of abating emissions from agriculture. Well, that puts the imperative on more carbon, dro- uh, carbon dioxide drawdown. Accepting at some point that you're not going to get a 0% emission cow. It's not going to exist. So you have to invest in alternatives to offset that built-in negative. And educating policymakers that on that side of it, on the, on the drawdown side, there's no strong, or at least initially, there's not going to be a strong money-making aspect to it. You're dealing with trash. You're dealing with something we don't want, and it costs money to extract that. But where Ireland can benefit and where everyone benefits is there's the societal environmental benefits, the need for it, the existential need. But there's also the thing, if Ireland can be that or one of those tech hubs, one of those centers of expertise, that's where the euros and the dollars are. That's where we, we become the brain trust for that or one of those. There's no reason why the next climate work or climb works has to be set up in Switzerland, but doing their rollouts in Iceland. They could come to Ireland or the next company could be in Ireland. For example, Javier or Morris's company, there's nothing that, as I understand it, that either of their companies are doing that is unique, that has to be done in Ireland. The whole thing is that these things can scale and Ireland doesn't have to solve the world's CO2 problem in Ireland, if if Ireland has if Ar- Ireland and Irish people have had any successes, that we're great at moving around the world and spreading ideas. So I think that's that's the strength that we can put into things. Uh, yeah, uh, very briefly, just to, to rate. Yeah, to, is, what I was going to say is, is, is a summary, really, or rate right rating what is being said today here is. Uh, so I think I'm very optimistic. Because in Ireland, for the reasons we've stated, we need to do it. There is, a, there is the drive to do it. There is the human capital. There is the political will to do it. And also, there is a track record. We've done it before. To give an example, Galway, tiny town, 80,000, 100,000 people, which would be, if we consider like a, a large village in, in, in other countries, it managed to attract some of the largest met the companies in the world and as a result of that and created that uh, uh, that, cl- that 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 hope that cluster then uh, dozens of startups that became successful met the companies indigenous companies they, they, they came from here so uh, I, i'm very i'm very um optimistic in the way that we can do the same thing with uh cdr technologies great so well optimistic so far <laughs> any further closing thoughts from anyone yes i would just say one thing cody i think um the carbon removal is a huge thing we've got a lot of work to do to get it to a certain scale and it being scientifically robust for us is the key thing and there's no point doing this if it just doesn't work so you know having having the science being really strong is really really key and i think ireland and we've discussed this already you know we've got really strong science credentials here so 
we're very happy to be based here and we think we've got a great pool and we're already hiring our you know, our first geochemists or postdocs and stuff from um, the Irish universities and stuff actually at the moment. So we're doing that. But as, to, as we want to scale this and we get the science all in order, policy is also key. And I've noticed this a little bit as well as, you know, if you have maybe a kind of a want from, say, the European Commission level to grow CDR, but at the local county council level, there isn't really an awareness of what enhanced weathering is or a geological storage of carbon, what that is. If there isn't a discussion between the, the tippy top of government in Europe and the more local level, I think it'll be very hard to scale carbon removal quickly. So I think getting the science in order is definitely paramount, but we should be also thinking ahead to growing this and thinking ahead means getting all levels of government on board with what, you know, what should be rolled out, which is hopefully large scale carbon removal across you know, the world, hopefully at some stage. Okay, well, I suppose we'll call it there for the evening then. So um, thank you all again. I'm wishing you all uh, the best of luck in your endeavours. And hopefully we'll uh, continue to watch CDR and Ireland grow into a really exciting space. So thank you all.